Thank you. It's, it's of course an honor and a privilege to be um, granted um, the opportunity to give a lecture here. It's also a bit of a challenge because um, translational considerations is a broad topic. So I decided to uh, stay in my comfort zone, look back at my own career and uh, show a couple of things where it did work well and did not work well, taking translational research into account. And I'll be showing some old data, but also some new data. So, the justification for what I do clinically and research is this. 50% of patients in GI actually have a normal workup in spite of the symptoms. And there could be two things. Could be the reassurance approach, saying nothing is wrong with you. But the other approach is, if the standard workup doesn't work well, where do symptoms come from? What are we missing? And I think it's disorders of motility and sensitivity, and I put this under the broad umbrella, and this is the name of the society as well, neurogastroenterology and motility disorder patients. So it's half of clinical practice. It's extremely prevalent, and not many of our colleagues are very enthusiastic about managing these patients because they say there's so little you can do. And actually, our understanding of pathogenesis and pathophysiology is limited. And that, of course, has an impact on the treatment uh, abilities. Vice versa, if you have a new effective treatment, it generates new insights. And effective treatments may actually enhance pathophysiological concepts and understanding of pathogenesis. And I view translational research as going from patient observations to animal and healthy subjects work. And in basic research, you have the physiology, pharmacology, disease models, and treatment concepts that you can test. Healthy subjects, I use quite a lot. You will see a lot of examples to do proof of concept studies, work with pharmacological tools, investigate pharmacology and pathophysiology as a concept. And of course, the patients feed into that by giving the clinical observations that raise the questions confirm or dispute pathophysiological mechanisms and generate and look at treatment outcomes. And we'll start with the clinical observation. Nothing very special, a patient, woman, 36 year old, works in government administration, non-smoker, no alcohol, history of panic attacks and depression, occasional heartburn and fullness after meals, she's been on and off a PPI for that, an allergic rash in 2011, car accident with whiplash in 2013, all of this kind of general medical history, but then in 2014 she went for a holiday in North Africa and she had an acute diarrhea there for which she received antibiotics and since then nothing has been the same. She has meal-related symptoms with decreased tolerance of food with early satiation, postprandial fullness, epigastric pain, upper abdominal bloating, heartburn, this is controlled with omeprazole, there's episodes of nausea, there's never any vomiting, there's belching and flatulence. She has crampy abdominal pains that wake her up at night. She has an alternating stool pattern with days of constipation, but also cramps with urgency and diarrhea. And she lost like nine kilos and she stopped work several times for consecutive days since then. To make conversation easier with patients, we use pictograms. And she has <coughs> postprandial fullness, she has early satiations, she has epigastric pain, no epigastric burning. She has upper abdominal bloating, she has retrosternal burning, she has nausea and belching. She has all dyspeptic symptoms. She's been investigated with biochemistry, which showed a low serum iron and vitamin B12, but easily corrected. Chest X-ray, abdominal ultrasound, and even abdominal CT scan were normal. She had an upper GI endoscopy showing grade A esophagitis. She was H. pylori negative. She had a negative iliac colonoscopy with biopsies. And the duodenal biopsies showed some discrete increase in the number of intraepithelial lymphocytes. Lamina propria itself seemed normal cellular and some slightly blunted villi characterized as Marsh 1 stage. There were no antibody signs of celiac disease and these are some of the spotted intraepithelial lymphocytes. Currently, she's on omeprazole 20 mg BID, trazodone 100 mg in the evening, dating back from an episode of depression in the past. And she's on an antihistamine for a skin rash, and she's previously, previously tried metoclopramide, domperidone, sulpiride, probiotics, low FODMAP diet, without any event. <laughs> 
And so she has meal-related symptoms there. And if we want to see what happens, well, let's delve into what happens when you eat a meal. And the stomach is, fasted, is contracted upon fasting, relaxes during feeding to store the meal, then empties it. There's pleasant perception. You have gastric acid secretion and release of peptides and duodenal secretions happening. And you can measure some of these functions. And we measure clinically emptying quite a lot. And in this patient, it was completely normal. We measure also symptoms during the breath test every 15 minutes. And this is the pattern in this patient. There was a rise of fullness and a rise of bloating early on after the meal, some belching, also some nausea and pain occurring. And after four hours, they're still at a certain level. We are one of the, maybe the only center in the world who uh, imposes gastric barostat studies on patients. So we tried it in that patient. We blow up a balloon, do stepwise distension, and measure accommodation to nutrient drink ingestion. And we could make two steps and then we had to stop because of pain. So she's clearly hypersensitive to balloon distension. And we tried to do the accommodation, but we had to pull out the balloon immediately after the start of the nutrient drink, because this is the normal pre- and postprandial volume in healthy volunteers. But here we had to stop. We don't know what accommodation looks like. So she has normal gastric emptying. She has a meal-induced symptom rise. She has hypersensitivity to gastric distension, accommodation, unclear. <laughs> And so the barostat has been very unpleasant. And in physiology textbook, it says gastric accommodation serves to prevent a rise in intragastric pressure during food intake. And nitric oxide is the key mediator of it. And we try, well, why, why could we not measure gastric pressures during meal intake as, as a substitute? And we started in the rats, making a fistula, pumping nutrients in and measuring pressure. And you get a gradual rise. And then as you infuse further volume, the rise stops. You get a plateau. Uh, we think this reflects accommodation because if you block it with a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, the pressure continues to rise. So this compensation effect, no further pressure rise in spite of continued infusion, is blunted. So this is probably accommodation measured as a pressure readout during nutrient infusion in the rat. So we tried to do the same in humans, and we just moved the high-resolution manometry catheter slightly deeper all the way up to the sphincter of Odi, I think, in the duodenum, and measured. And we put in another catheter and infused nutrients. And you can see the lower esophageal sphincter as this pressure band. You can see phasic contractions in the antrum, and you see some duodenal contractions. And then when we start the infusion, you get a lowering of pressure in the proximal stomach. And if you put this for a bunch of healthy volunteers together, you get a pressure drop followed by a pressure rise, completely different from the rat doesn't look like the rat pressure profile at all. And we did the same in the patient, and this is the, patient, the pressure drop in the patient and then the rise. And we do this until maximal satiation, and so the patient stopped a lot earlier than volunteers. We tried the same with LNMMA pretreatment in healthy subjects. And with LNMMA, you rise the basic pressure. But if you give the nutrient drink infusion, there's a pressure drop and, and recovery, which is blunted compared to the placebo. So this is nitric oxide sensitive, requires nitric oxide synthesis. And if we look at the maximum tolerated volume, they stop earlier. And there's about a 20, 25% drop in nutrient volume tolerance. Well, very remarkable. If you look at this nadir pressure and then the rise again, and you correlate this with scoring of meal-induced satiation every minute, you get a linear correlation. The rise in intragastric pressure from nadir goes linearly with the rise of satiation scores until 5, which is maximum, and we stop. And during LNMMA, nutrient volume tolerance is decreased, but this linear relationship is retained. So there is a kind of determinant of pressure recovery that drives meal-induced satiation under both conditions, saline and nitric oxide. And if it's nitric oxide, in spite of the different sensitive, in spite of the different profile, from rats, we think it may reflect accommodation. Is this relevant? Well, we did this, not we, Florencia uh, Carbone, my um, <coughs> PhD student who's in the audience, did this in a bunch of healthy volunteers and patients with functional dyspepsia. This is the healthy volunteers, pressure drop recovery. This is the FT patients. So they have a drop, a decreased drop. They have earlier satiation for the same nutrient volume in, in infusion, and they have 
a marked reduced nutrient volume tolerance. So that raises the suggestion that accommodation drives a relaxation of the stomach followed by a pressure recovery in humans. That activates mechanoreceptors and drives meal-induced satiation. And if this is impaired, you get early satiation and perhaps weight loss. Uh, it's easy to come up with such a scheme. How do you prove that this makes sense? When do you believe that a mechanism is relevant in explaining symptoms? And we put a couple of uh, clever people, amongst them our chairman, together, and we came up with a thinking exercise that generated this paper, Plausibility Criteria for Putative Pathophysiological Mechanisms in FGID, just online in gut. And we came up with five criteria. The mechanism has to be present, the abnormality, in at least a subset of the patient, has to have a temporal association, needs to be correlated with the severity of the symptom. And we have all of these for impaired accommodations present in a subset. Um, it is associated with early satiation. The more suppressed accommodation, the more early satiation and weight loss is. If you can induce it in healthy volunteers, impair accommodation with an hydric oxide synthase inhibitor, you induce decreased nutrient tolerance. And the final, the cherry on the cake is, if you reverse it by therapeutic, you should have a therapeutic response. If you normalize the abnormality, you should get the symptom better. Now that is a challenge. How do you restore impaired accommodation? For this, we went back to basic research. And there's very little. Old Scandinavian studies from the 70s, 80s, and then stopped studying the accommodation reflex, but you can put this together. Nutrients in the GI tract through a vagal-vagal pathway will relax the proximal stomach by releasing nitric oxide from inhibitory motor neurons, and the second messenger is nitric oxide, and the second messenger is cyclic, cyclic GMP. You can mimic the effect of uh, nitric oxide by giving nitrates. We did a mill nitrite inhalations acutely. It was terrible. The smell was terrible. Everybody got hypotension. We stopped. So, and there's other uses of amylonitrite as well, which I don't need to go into. Then we thought, why not prolong the effect of cyclic GMP with sildenafil, phosphodiesterase inhibitor? Florencia did the rat study. To our surprise, sildenafil rose the pressure. It seemed to inhibit accommodation in the rat pressure model during nutrient infusion. We did the same in humans, and the pressure drop and recovery were actually suppressed as well. So you would expect this drug is going to relax the proximal stomach, enhance accommodation. The two pressure measurements say it does not. It does the opposite. Is it credible? Probably is, because there's more nutrient-induced satiation in the sildenafil con condition. And nutrient volume tolerance is suppressed. So sildenafil was the wrong bet. If we go up one floor, there is a serotonin receptor there, and it's partially characterized, not very well characterized, but perhaps this could be a target. So we looked into finding a specific ligand for that. And there was literature from Michael Schiemann's group in the rat, in the um, guinea pig stomach, looking at serotonin. And there's two types, a rapid response and a slow response. And the rapid response is 5-HT3, is in neurons that project orally. And the slow response predominantly um, is a 5-HT1P receptor, how it's called, is mainly in neurons that project aborally. And those who project aborally with the slow response are nitrogic. They express NADPH, whereas the proximally um, um, projecting ones who have 5-HT3 responses are cholinergic. So this suggests that there is a 5-HT1 receptor on nitrogic neurons in the stomach. And this is a biphasic response. You see that in some neurons. And I learned electrophysiology with uh, Jack Wood when we tested a couple of ligands. And the migraine drug, at that time novel migraine drug, somatriptan, actually mimics this 1P effect in the guinea pig. If that would apply in humans, it should relax the proximal stom stomach through release of nitric oxide. We first looked into mice or others looked into mice. and so. In mice, somatriptan relaxes the stomach, and this involves nitric oxide release in the guinea pig. We took it to humans, and if you do a Barostat study, this is the proximal stomach volume before and after somatriptan subcutaneously. It mimics the accommodation reflex in healthy volunteers, and it dose-dependently is inhibited by nitric oxide synthase inhibition. 
And if you give somatriptan before a meal, you actually get less satiation for the same volume ingested. So actually, you can increase stomach volume, um, reduce meal-induced satiation in healthy volunteers, and this is nitrogen. So we went and did acute studies in patients, and we could enhance impaired accommodation in patients. We could increase nutrient volume tolerance in patients. And if we measured meal-related symptoms and pooled them, after placebo or subcutaneous somatriptan, we had a significant beneficial effect. So we thought, this is great, but we need another drug. You cannot inject an expensive um, injectable three times a day before a meal. So we tried the nasal spray of somatriptan and healthy volunteers, and it did nothing. So then we needed to find another drug, and there was a lot of research ongoing in serotonin ligands looking at gastric accommodation, and both in the dog and in the cat, 5-HT1A agonists relax the stomach differently. In the cat, this is mediated by, this is in the dog, this is mediated uh, by nitric oxide uh, release, whereas in the cat, this is not Really, uh, in influence by nitric oxide release. And it seems to be a 1A receptor. So we took this into humans and did a dose finding study with buspirone um, looking at the barostat in healthy volunteers and we get a dose dependent relaxation of the proximal stomach. We then did a crossover trial in patients and placebo did very little to symptoms. Buspirone had a modest effect on symptoms but it restored accommodation. So we thought we are there. So we added buspirone, 3 times 5 milligrams, to the patient and then increased it to 3 times 10 milligrams. We thought we've cracked the code, restored accommodation. The patient should be fine. <coughs> Six weeks later, we see her back and the patient is not so happy. Um, buspirone gave some drowsiness initially, then it was better. And actually, she's not better. Upon close questioning, perhaps reflecting clinician and investigator enthusiasm, she agrees that there's some improvement of early satiety, perhaps, but all the rest has really not changed. The fullness after meals is there, the bloating, the pain persists, and there's no further weight loss, that's good, but there's also no weight regain. And she's fatigued, cannot work very well. So we hardly did anything with this accommodation restoration treatment that we found through human healthy volunteer translational research. And so these are meal-related symptoms. There was weight loss, and these are unsolved, and we know that she was hypersensitive to gastric distension. And maybe this is more important. Maybe this is what we should have focused on. Now, that is very difficult. Most animal models of hypersensitivity and pharmacological interventions do not translate well into the human. And this is mainly done with colorectal distension, balloon distension tests. In the proximal GI tract stomach, there's almost no animal studies. In all textbooks, it says conceptually you have two types of mechanoreceptors, considering their position relative to the smooth muscle. You have those who are positioned in series to the smooth muscle and those who are positioned in parallel. And if you blow up a balloon, like we did to test sensitivity, you will stretch both of them. You will activate both of them. But they react differently to relaxation. The tension receptor is inactivated, whereas the elongation receptor is activated. And the opposite would happen if you had a contraction against a resistance, a fixed meal volume, for instance. Then the tension receptor would be activated. The elongation receptor would be inactivated. What do we know about the human mechanoreceptors in the stomach? Nothing. Unfortunately, almost nothing. If you look at surveys from animal research, there's two types of structures that have been <coughs> developed, identified, um, that could reflect two types of mechanoreceptors. The intraganglionic laminar endings and the intramuscular arrays. And in this review from Terry Pauli, the intramuscular array is the one that responds to tissue distortion receptive relaxation and stretching. So perhaps this is the elongation receptor. And the IGLE, the interganglionic uh, laminar ending, is the one that responds to mixing, so contraction against the resistance, uh, tension buildup, and tissue distortion. So perhaps this is the tension type of mechanoreceptor. 
And if we go back to the scheme, if this is the one which is involved, the way to inactivate it would be relaxation of the stomach. But we already did that. We gave buspirone, it relaxes the stomach. And the symptoms did not improve beyond early satiation. So I think this is a little bit of a dead end and perhaps this awaits identification of the molecular nature of the mechanoreceptors in the stomach. There's candidate channels, but we don't know for sure. And if we go back to the patient symptom profile, early satiation happens during the meal. So here somewhere in the first 15 minutes, and there are symptoms ongoing four hours after the meal. And the emptying was normal. So clearly we are missing something. And clearly there must be symptoms coming from the small bowel as well. And this was elegantly analyzed in a paper by Hanno van Heel and some other people of my group published in Neurogastro. And there was also these crampy abdominal pains waking up the patient in the middle of the night. This cannot be early satiation. I mean, the stomach is empty at 2 o'clock in the night. So we are missing um, some aspects. So we did a 24-hour small bowel manometry. Six channels. This is the compressed trace showing five of the channels. One of them was defective. I had to eliminate it. And this is what we see. And we see actually normal amplitude contractions. We see propagated phases three in the digestive phase. But then there's the, like this abnormally or non-propagated phase three. Is this a retrograde from this one? Or is this an abortive one? And then there are these bursts here of high amplitude contractions, not a phase three, beyond the normal range. These were associated with pain. So something is happening in the small bowel. There is uncoordinated motility as well. What do we know about this? Almost nothing. There is one series of patients, of similar patients, described in the paper as severe IBS, but I think they really had severe intestinal dysmotility like the patient I show you, uh, abnormal small bowel manometry, and there were infiltrates of, of lymphocytes in the myentary plexus, peri and intraganglionic location, and some intraepithelial lymphocytosis and some neuronal degradation. This is what the literature says in this paper from Hans Tornblom. So this patient has impaired accommodation, normal emptying. This happened after acute diarrhea in North Africa, low-grade duodenal inflammation. You remember the lymphocytes, hypersensitivity, small bowel dysmotility. Do we have a model for that? I don't think so um, until recently, but we have been working on one. We were interested in studying diabetic neuropathy and studied the bio-breathing rat, looking at this. But actually, there is a diabetes-prone and a diabetes-resistant group. And of the diabetes-prone group, 50% develop diabetes. And this is where we studied diabetic neuropathy of the bowel. But the other 50% actually um, developed some other abnormalities that we think could constitute a spontaneous animal model of the patient like I described it to you. And we compared this to a control group, which is a diabetes resistance strain. So we followed up the, the rats. We got rid of those with diabetes for most of our analysis and showed this strain, which did not develop diabetes, compared to the control strain. And we followed them over time until 220 days. And this is Tim van Uitsel's work. He's also in the audience. And we measured mucosal resistance. And there's increased small bowel permeability as of 50 days in this model. And there is low-grade inflammation in the mucosa. There's no ulcers but if you, and no overt lesions. But if you count um, um, inflammatory cells or if you do MPO like we do here, you get mucosal inflammation as of 70 days. And this includes also a rise in mast cells compared to the control animals shown here at 160 days. And then at 160 days, um, the inflammatory infiltrate moves to the neuromuscular layer, to the myenteric plexus, and there is a loss of nitrogic innervation. The blue dots are actually eliminated in the um, non-diabetic BBDP rats. And if we count the number of NOS neurons, they are significantly suppressed. And if we look at gastric accommodation with nutrient infusion and pressure measurement, this is a control rat, baseline, and with LNMMA, the pressure rises. The pressure rises at ba baseline during nutrient infusion in the, in the BBDP rat are higher, and there's no well-name effect. 
and the nitrogen component in the accommodation is gone. They have impaired accommodation, less um, nitrogen motor neurons in the small bowel and in the stomach, and recent data presented at DDW last year, if we do rectal distension, they are hypersensitive as well. They have an increased visceral motor response. So that animal model suggests actually that there is a prime event of increased permeability going to low-grade inflammation, loss of nitrogen control. Raises a lot of questions. Is this relevant to the human? Why does it happen? Is the sequence right? And so on and so on. But it gives you a model to look at. So why is there the preference for nitrogenic neurons? Because we counted cholinergic neurons, nothing happened to them. They're still there. Basic contractility seems to be preserved. A couple of hypotheses. We first thought maybe if you are hanging in a cytokine soup long, maybe the phenotype of neurons changes. So we exposed um, LMMP preparations to cytokine perfusions for prolonged days. We looked at responsiveness. There was a kind of biphasic effect, stimulating and then inhibiting response. But there was no effect on number of neurons and on chemical coding. So just being in an inflammatory soup will not get rid of the nitrogenic neurons. However, if you get inflammation, you get overexpression of INOS, excess nitric oxide, nitric oxide, um, related free radicals causing oxidative stress, and we hypothesize that this might damage preferentially nitrogenic neurons who already have an endogenous nitric oxide load as well, and who might be more vulnerable. And we tested this in a culture dish of myenteric neurons, and with increasing uh, concentrations of nitric oxide donors, we get progressive loss of the nitrogenic population. We could worsen this when we depleted glutathione, and we could reverse this if we gave the nitric oxide donor together with reduced glutathione. So oxidative stress at least has the potential to get rid specifically of the nitrogenic neuron population in a dish. And then there's this recent hypothesis by Mark Pimentel, which I find kind of intriguing, which I think we should also consider. He actually showed that antibodies against a bacterial toxin, cytolethal distending toxin B, are present in mainly post-infectious IBS. And this is produced by most of the usual culprits that cause post-infectious IBS. And these antibodies cross-react with vinculin, cell adhesion protein expressed in some crucial neuromuscular apparatus elements. And in a paper in PLOS One, they showed that antibodies to... Uh, this toxin actually cross-reacts with vinculin in rats, and this is associated with loss of ICC and nerves. This is looking at anti-CDT antibodies, anti-CKIT, and they co-localize. And the same is done here with, um, with S100, and they also co-localize. And this is done both in the rat and in the human ileum. And if you look at rats which have been exposed to Campylobacter infected, there is a loss of um, vinculin expression. And if you have rats who have a single or a second infection, actually the vinculin load progressively decreases. So perhaps this is a model. Perhaps if this antibody would be specifically targeting nitrogenic neurons, it might also explain why in some post-infectious um, um, conditions, the nitrogenic population is lost and some of the clinical manifestations impaired accommodation, but also diarrhea and so on, could fit. So I think this is room to look at. The increased intestinal permeability is the prime movement in the, in, in the rat model. But does it happen in patients? Hanna van Heel did a series of studies where they took, she took bio, we took biopsies from uh, FD patients and age and sex matched controls. And the electrical resistance is lower in functional dyspepsia and the transmembrane flux in an oozing chamber of fluorescent molecules is higher in the patient. So they have a leaky duodenum. Is there low-grade inflammation? If you count eosinophils and mast cells, they are about double in the patients compared to the age matched controls. And there was a correlation between 
the increased permeability and the loads of inflammatory cells. So at least in the dyspeptic patients, in the duodenum, both have to do with each other. So increased intestinal permeability is there, low-grade inflammation is there in the patient. We don't have evidence for this sequence in this direction, could be in the other direction as well. This has not been established yet. Is there altered neural control? We took biopsies from functional dyspepsia patients, and they were, by Carla Cirillo, were, were dissected free and loaded with calcium imaging dyes, and then looking at activation. And both the amplitude of responses to potassium depolarization and to electrical tract stimulation were suppressed in the patients. The number of neurons were similar. And if you look at the percentage responding neurons to these kind of stimuli, high potassium or electrical stimulation, these were also suppressed. There were other markers of neuronal dysfunction. So submucous plexus neurons in the human, in functional dyspepsia patients, show impaired neuronal activity. So the altered neural control is also there. Does that lead to GI dysmotility, altered sensitivity symptoms? More difficult to test, I think. And to answer that, we should probably have a way to impose this in healthy subjects. And if you want to impose it in healthy subjects, we want to have an idea what causes it. What causes it if you ask the patient, it's stress or food? We started off with stress. And if you look at basic research, if you give CRA, if you um, do stress models, um, for instance, restrained stress in rats, you get increased permeability, um, and this can be blocked by a CRF antagonist and mimicked by administration of, a, of CRF itself. And if you take biopsies of the colon, of healthy subjects, and you expose them to corticotropin-releasing hormone, you actually get degranulation um, of mast cells. You get activation of mast cells, studied by EM in this paper. And you can counteract this effect by blocking it with a CRH antagonist, but also by giving a um, mast cell stabilizing drug. And so Tim van Uitzel studied this in a real-life model. And I'm... Uh, I'm a clinician, I'm also a researcher, but I also teach students. So we thought we had the ideal model of stress, students taking exam. Master thesis presentation. Um, and so we had students lining up for measurement of intestinal permeability using the lactulose manitol test during control condition. Then during a thesis defense, they collected urine prior and after the thesis defense, and they had increased intestinal permeability. And then we found another stressful thing. They were put in a dark room for half an hour. There were countdowns happening um, several times, and one out of two, when the countdown reached zero, they received a slightly unpleasant electrical impulse to the, to the, to the arm. That tended to, but did not significantly increase intestinal permeability. However, it was stressful because the stress scores were elevated in both of the experimental conditions compared to baseline, and cortisol levels were only significantly elevated in the thesis condition, and that correlated with the lactulose manitol measured increase in intestinal permeability. In the rats, you could mimic this by CRH, and you could block it by pretreatment with mast cell blockers. So we studied another cohort um, where we gave a mast cell stabilizer, and that did not affect salivary cortisol and stress levels measured with the sty. Um, then we gave CRH, which increased cortisol, and with the mast cell stabilizer present, the rise in cortisol was, um, uh, was not suppressed um, in response to CRH. Um, and then if we look at lactulose manitol ratio, there was a rise in permeability with the CRH administration, which was suppressed by pretreatment with a mast cell stabilizer. So in humans, administration of CRH increases intestinal permeability involving mast cells. And then a very fortunate group of patients, of students, was allowed to take the master thesis again after pretreatment with a mast cell blocker. 
and they were stressed, they had elevated salivary cortisols, but their intestinal permeability was not altered. So, at least in humans, stress can increase intestinal permeability through a mast cell dependent mechanism. So, this is one player, but it's less easy to use for motility measurements and so on, because maintaining stress is not so easy over time. Second thing is, if you then go in to take biopsies and so on, this is stressful in itself in healthy volunteers. So perhaps this was not the ideal model. We started to look for others. And bile acids, actually, can also increase mucosal permeability dose-dependently, in this case the oxycholic acid, in the jejunum and in the colon, um, acutely or after prolonged exposure. And so Doreen Beekmans, who is also here in the audience, did a study where biopsies were taken from healthy volunteers, 25, and patients with functional dyspepsia mounted in nursing chambers, and a catheter was left to aspirate bile, and we looked at bile composition. This generated a lot of data. I'm just showing you two things. We measured bile profiles in the duodenum before and after a standardized nutrient drink meal in healthy volunteers and in patients. And to our surprise, the bile concentration levels were significantly lower in the patients compared to the healthy volunteers. And if you took the ratio primary over secondary bile acids, this was significantly lower in the patients. And there was a correlation between this, the level between primary and secondary bile acids in patients, and the mucosal permeability. The higher this ratio, the, the lower this ratio, the higher the flux of fluorescent molecules, um, and the lower this, the higher this ratio, the, uh, the the lower this ratio, the lower the electrical resistance. So it actually suggests that patients have a different bile acid composition. Secondary is higher, so this could reflect bacterial flora manipulation of bile acid, but it seems to be correlated with mucosal permeability in FD patients. And there's a poster on that uh, presented by Doreen at this meeting. So bile composition, early days, we need to look into this, but could be a very important player. Last one is acid. If you put the duodenum from animals in a oozing chamber and you give pulses of acid, pH goes up and down and you get permeabilization. And over time you get a permeabilization which is restored, worsened if you give uh, VIP and worsened if you block nitric oxide synthase. Um, and actually, patients with functional dyspepsia, compared to healthy volunteers, if we clip pH electrodes to the proximal duodenum, you have a certain baseline pH. And uh, after a meal, this drops lower in functional dyspepsia patients compared to health. This is a study done by Kwang Jai Lee when he was in Leuven. He's in the audience as well. So patients with functional dyspepsia have more acid in the duodenum. And so Hannah did a study where we put a catheter in the small bowel and we perfused acid and then we took biopsies and we measured electrical resistance and acid perfusion decreases mucosal resistance in the duodenum. And it, this is associated with a decreased expression at the protein level of Claudine 3. Um, and this is associated with the release of tryptase, so probably activates mast cells as well. And Kwang Jai Lee, when he was with us in the past, compared meal-induced accommodation during saline perfusion or acid perfusion of the duodenum, and acid perfusion blocks meal-induced accommodation. And there is a poster on that, uh, an oral later today by Tim van Uitzel on the same set of experiments. So actually, acid is another player, and acid is the easiest one to look into motility, and so acid decreases mucosal integrity, and if you give a meal, you get earlier satiation, and you get higher symptom ratings after a meal in the presence of acid, suggesting that perhaps this can indeed cause GI dysmotility symptoms through dysmotility and perhaps through visceral hypersensitivity. So if that is the mechanism, well, we need to treat it. And you can think of a couple of things in the rat model. Of course, you can give acid suppression. The patient was already on acid suppression. And studies of acid suppression in this type of patient have shown some benefit, but nothing striking. So that's not the answer. 
we're interfering with bile now, doing studies with uh, changing the bile acid pool stress. Very difficult to take away, but on the other hand, I'm only a half believer in stress because I often say to patients, if this was really caused by stress, I would have it as well. I have enough stress in my life and I have none of these symptoms. So this is difficult. We're working on the bile as it has been tried, but the intestinal permeability, there has been a oligopeptide proposed that could restore impaired intestinal permeability, larazotide. We decided to test that in the BB rat model. Low-grade inflammation, you can test this as well. We're working on budesonide, but first we use the heavy hammer of cyclosporin in the rat model. And alter neurocontrol, you could look at INOS inhibitors, antioxidants, and perhaps in the future, BDNF, just to name a few. I'll go quickly through a set of series of experiments, treatment interventions in this BB rat model. You need to maintain them for months, chronic long-term studies, most of it unpublished. Larazotide failed to restore decreased mucosal permeability in the BBDP rat and uh, failed to restore the uh, permeability to fluorescent molecules. That was part of Tim van Uitzel's thesis. So in our hands, larazotide failed to change the mucosal permeability. We didn't look at all of the other aspects. Aminoguanidine, INOS inhibitor, in our hands, decreased INOS expression, suppressed the inflammatory cell infiltrate, restored the number of NOS neurons, and restored the impairment of contractility. We published that two and a half years ago. Cyclosporin, unpublished, but in our hands, suppressed the rise in MPO activity uh, in the BBDP rat, and restored borderline significantly the number of NOS neurons as well. And then antioxidants in our hands did not restore, uh, suppress the inflammatory infiltrate in the BBDP rat and did not restore nitrogic numbers. It did do so in the diabetic rat as a side thing, but I hit this, this is not the topic. So antioxidants did not work. But none of these can be used in the patient. And she was on buspirone, still in pain, um, losing weight, nocturnal cramps. The anti-inflammatory therapies are not an option. We don't have a good, suitable mast cell stabilizer, I think, to use in clinical applications in humans or not established. So we just gave the old hat antispasmolytics, otilonium bromide three times daily, and a peppermint oil before going to sleep in the hope that perhaps the nocturnal crampy episodes waking her up coming from the small bowel would be suppressed. At follow-up, the patient says the pain is somewhat better but the lack of appetite remains there and there is no weight recovery. And so, well, the buspirone did a little bit, these two did a little bit, we continue with them, but the problem to the patient is not solved. And there's a loss of appetite, which is really predominant and dominating the symptom. And I'm from Leuven and um, Iman mentioned Gaston van Trappen, but another eminent researcher that uh, was um, instrumental in making Leuven what it is now is Theo Peters. And he had a profound interest in motilin, and that's understating it. I think Theo Peters' life work was motilin. Unfortunately, Theo Peters passed away in July. Um, so I'd like to pay this tribute to him. So we talked a lot about appetite, and ghrelin came up as the gut hunger hormone. But we were interested in motilin, and there's a lot of similarities between motilin and ghrelin. So we just studied it um, based on a lot of concepts that we discussed with Theo and with Inge de Porter, his successor in the lab. And we measured in healthy volunteers over fasting every 10 minutes hunger ratings and ghrelin plasma levels. And this is what we found. There is no significant correlation. Hunger in humans does not move with ghrelin plasma levels. We did motilin assays at the same time, and in humans, motilin plasma levels correlate surprisingly closely with hunger scores. And then we threw in a motilin receptor agonist, erythromycin, and on the ghrelin correlation, which was absent, it didn't do anything but it displaced the strong motilin correlation with hunger 
because this is a competitor for the same effect that you do not measure with your radio immunoassay. And you shift the correlation curve, actually saying that motilin is indeed acting on motilin receptors to drive hunger ratings in humans. So my bias is that ghrelin is indeed a genuine hunger hormone, mainly for rats and mice. I think in man, it is motilin. It's a forgotten peptide, but we should revisit it. And if we measure over time hunger ratings, they go up and down, but they correlate closely with phases of the MMC, phase three of the MMC. And we know that this is driven by motilin plasma peaks correlate heavily with peak hunger scores. And we studied a group of patients like the patient I presented, loss of appetite, no desire to eat at all. And hunger ratings in healthy controls over time, over three hours, look like this. In this type of patients, it looks like this. Area under the curve is very low. And the healthy volunteers have hunger peaks, which coincide with phase three um, and motilin uh, contractility peaks in the antrum. And this is absent in the patients. And these patients have a loss of motilin effect and motilin secretion, probably. We need to work on the latter. And that is a little bit difficult. Because if you want to crack the release mechanisms of motilin, you all are aware of the model of how GI peptides are released from enteroendocrine cells with uh, secondary messengers, and then peptides acting on afferent nerves and on neighboring cells and taste receptors and other nutrient recognizing receptors. And you can study this in rats and mice, but not for motilin. Because if you look at the human motilin gene and you look where it should be in rodents, there is actually a stop codon in there, both for the receptor and for the gene itself. So you cannot study motilin in small species, so you have to go to higher ones. And Evelyn De Lose in our lab worked on that. She worked on the lab, in the lab of Fiona Gribble. And in pig duodenum, a bitter tastant, so who would work on these bitter receptors, dose dependently releases motilin from the duodenal mucosa. This is early days, unfinished work in progress, but I thought I might share it. Does this translate? Well, if you take human duodenum, numbers are lower, but you get the same tendency. Bitter agonist dose dependently seems to release motilin from the duodenum. This is in vitro resection specimen. In vivo, the opposite. This is time after administration of two bitter agonists, denatonum, benzoate, and quinine. This is the placebo, a rise in motilin, and this is a, there is a drop in motilin with both bitter agonists. So something is different in vitro than in vivo. What is not there in vitro? The vagal nerve, for instance, is gone. But also, the stomach is not there. And if you put denatonium, denatonium benzoate in the pig stomach, you get a dose-dependent release of somatostatin. And you can mimic that in the human stomach. And for instance, somatostatin is a candidate to inhibit, to suppress release of motilin. That shows you how difficult it is to translate sometimes, because for motilin, you need to use big animals. At least in my view, a pig is a big animal. It's not so easy to sacrifice a pig compared to a guinea pig or a mouse or a rat. So translational does not always work. But perhaps there is a potential to treat the anorexia in these patients because if you infuse erythromycin, the motilin agonist, in healthy subjects, you get a peak motilin uh, contractility in the stomach moving to the small bowel. This is phase three. And this is associated with the hunger peak. So we're exploring this now in patients it's too early to use this clinically. So I treated the patient with mirtazapine, 15 milligram in the evening. Um, and I had the option of trying a low dose erythromycin for appetite, but I didn't need to do that because she was good with mirtazapine. There's also translational reasons to use that. So signs of low grade duodenal inflammation, increased mucosal permeability, hypersensitivity, a history of depression, loss of appetite, is there any general concept available? Is there anything that can explain why this unfortunate patient had to have 
all of that. Well, we're thinking endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids actually, 2-AG for instance, um, will enhance mucosal resistance in a dish if applied basolaterally. And the damage, uh, the inflammatory infiltrate induced by LPS is suppressed if you use cannabinoid agonists uh, as a pretreatment. If we give Rimonabant, a CB1 receptor blocker to healthy volunteers, we block meal-induced accommodation, we induce early satiation. If we give Rimonabant, a blocker of the CB1 receptor, and we look at the distribution of gastric versus small bowel starting phases three, and the, pink, the pale blue ones are the ones that generate hunger peaks, under Rimonabant, these are suppressed. Gastric phase three is gone if you do not have endocannabinoid action, whereas in the placebo condition, 50% still comes from the stomach, is a hunger peak. These hunger peaks are gone, and you see this here, hunger ratings um, with the phase three during Rimonabant or placebo condition. So this drug actually, uh, so the endocannabinoid system has an effect on mucosal permeability, on activation of mucosal inflammation. It inhibits accommodation if your endocannabinoid system is defective. It suppresses hunger peaks and probably motilin release. And it is associated with psychosocial comorbidity. Stress responses through CRH involve the endocannabinoid system. And the endocannabinoid system is a key player um, in preventing post-traumatic stress. And if it's defective, you will have more post-traumatic stress. And so we put a couple of uh, patients with functional dyspepsia under a PET scanner and did radio ligand imaging for the CB1 receptor and compared this to age and sex matched healthy controls. And there are several brain areas where there's overexpression of the CB1 receptor in the patients. And these are areas involved in visceral sensitivity and nutrient tolerance. And we followed other patients after one year and you see these are the controls, these are the patients at baseline. One year later, the enhanced expression is still there, in spite of some improvement of symptoms and some recovery of body weight. So this seems to be a stable signal. So we are thinking that perhaps decreased endocannabinoid tone could be a key feature in these patients. And this is, I think, work for the coming future. So, for clinical and pathophysiological and therapeutic research, basic research is a key source of concept generation, target identification. Healthy subject research is a key source for proof of concept studies, evaluation of pharmacological concepts. Optimizing translation requires close interaction between clinician researchers and basic researchers. Or, in the best case, clinicians with experience in basic research, but I'm afraid this is becoming a species which is rare and threatened with extinction. Choice of models and their limitations requires critical consideration. And I'm from Target, Translational Research Center for Gastrointestinal Disorders in Leuven. Translational research is our motto, and these are some of the people that I work with there, the senior staff. I put in Theo Peters, he's retired, but he contributed to some of the ideas that I uh, mentioned here, and these are the people of my group who do all the work, and some of them are present here, and I want to thank them, and thank you.